Good morning, Natalie. Welcome to the future of medical education in critical care. You are here too. Well, actually, why are you here? I'm here to learn. And what is it that you want to learn? Uh, I want to be better at what I do. Better. What does it mean to be better? Um, I want to be a resuscitationist and an educator. I want to be better at what I do and help others to learn as well. So you want to be an educator? Yeah, I've heard that they get lots of time and lots of respect and lots of money and they basically just make the world a better place. Okay, well, enthusiasm is a great thing, but have you ever stopped to consider where medical education is going, whether it works, and what do you really mean by better? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself how good you are as a clinician, and how would you even know? Well, I passed all my exams the first time, and I haven't been arrested yet. <laughs> okay, so you're probably not dangerous. But are exams, are they a fair reflection of your practice? Do you have to deal with a lot of MCQs in the recess room? Do you write a short answer paragraph before intubating your head injured patient? Oh, no, I guess not. I mean, evaluation is tricky, but we have to have some way of assessing people, don't we? What about simulation? I love simulation. Oh, yes, simulation. Does it really improve patient outcomes? How can we show it's worth all the time, the effort, the cost, and technology to simulate healthcare rather than just getting out there and treating patients? Well, it feels like it's useful. And sometimes it is tough. Most of the instructors are idiots. And I have only done it twice in the last year. Twice in the last year? I think that's actually more than some people here. So it sounds like simulation may not be the answer to everything. Maybe not, but I think in the future we're going to have virtual reality and stuff. And you know, by the time we come to Smack Manchester, we'll be able to like use this kind of extra fast, extra efficient technology, and we won't even need to do any of this stuff. Or not, we can do it all on our phones. Okay. I'm I'm surprised you've not mentioned social media yet. Oh yeah, that's definitely the future. Because uh, like, we're all connected now, and basically formal education is a waste of time. I don't really need any of that. I can get everything I need through phone resources, and they're better, they're more entertaining, they're completely accessible to me, and then I've got this big stack of books that I can just use to keep the door open in the summer. Hmm, foam. A panacea? Are you sure? No, I'm not really certain about that, to be honest. Well, it seems to me that you're not really certain about much at all, so it's, it's a good thing that you got up after the rather exciting dinner last night mm -hmm. and this morning, and we're here to light the flame of medical education and ask the difficult questions about simulation, technology, assessment, and respect. So I may, may I welcome you all to lighting the flame of critical care education. Thank mm -hmm. you, Natalie. Good morning, everybody. Are we all feeling fantastic this morning? <laughs> there seems to be slightly fewer people in the auditorium this morning. I don't know where they are. Um, perhaps they're in bed, but maybe they're streaming on social media so they can all join in. Hello at home. Maybe not. So welcome to this morning, and congratulations for being here. We have some time this morning to ask the difficult questions which Natalie just took us through. We're going to look at the future of medical education, and we're going to ask some challenging questions of a panel of experts, and they are experts. I've got a bit of imposter syndrome here, which is why I'm the chair, and the experts are around me. Now, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, and I'm going to ask them three questions, because everything comes in threes, educationally. So number one, their name. Number two, where they're from. And number three, one interesting thing about them, which has got nothing to do with medicine. Walter. My name is Walter Epic, and I'm a pediatric emergency physician from Chicago at Northwestern University. And something interesting about me, hmm, one of my favorite places in the world is Sydney, Australia, looking at the Opera House. 
Good morning. I'm Jenny Rudolph. I'm an organizational behavior scholar by training, uh, but I sit in an anesthesia department at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And a little known fact about me is that I lost a speed climbing competition because I forgot to visualize the fifth hold, and when I got to it, uh, I fell off. Oops. Uh, my name is Chris Nixon. I'm a intensivist at the Alfred ICU in Melbourne, but I am a New Zealander, and I'm a coalface clinical educator. The thing that might be interesting about me, I do have a slight subversiveness to my nature, and I think that kind of started when I was about 10 years old living in the Middle East, and I kind of got captured underneath a military vehicle inside an army camp that I had kind of crawled into. That's not entirely normal <laughs> behavior, my friend. Um, I should introduce myself. I'm Simon Carley. I'm from Manchester. And the interesting fact for me is I've never been to a popular music concert. This is the closest I've ever been to a concert. Uh, I'm Victoria Brazel. I'm an emergency physician from the Gold Coast, Australia. And the interesting thing about me is I'm secretly into, well, not so secretly, into bird watching. So I know the difference between a uh, double bar and a zebra finch. That's very useful. <laughs> Just some feedback for you there. <laughs> my, my name is Daniel Cabrera. I'm an emergency physician. I work at uh, Mayo Clinic in the United States. And the thing that most of you don't know, but you may suspect, is I can, I can time travel, but only forward. So I'm Sandra Vickers. I am a resident in internal med medicine and a sim and medica medical education researcher at Copenhagen Academy for Medical Education and Simulation. And fun fact, um, I've never been to Australia, and I really want to go, but I'm shit scared of spiders. So just sitting in a panel with Australians, I'm like, what's crawling out of your pockets right now? Stop <laughs> <it>. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jesse Spur. I'm a nurse educator at uh, Redcliffe Hospital Emergency Department in Queensland. Um, interesting fact about me, or maybe not that interesting, did my first ever handstand at the age of 34 last year. It wasn't pretty, but I did it. OK, so excellent. This is a very senior panel of experts. So what we want to do is we want to hear their views, not mine. So I'm going to kick them off with, I think, one of the most challenging questions we have in medical education. And that is how we reconcile the difficulty at all levels of education, actually, undergraduate, postgraduate, of all healthcare practitioners, is how we train people for a job which we're expecting them to do in, say, five or ten years' time, but also train them for the here and now. And I know that, Daniel, you've got some thoughts on this. So it's the uh, issue of the needs of the present versus the needs of the future. And I think at least this side of the panel I th we thought probably that the future for us will look a little bit like the present that we live when we're training. But the reality for most of, most of you who are in training is the future will look like way different uh, compared to the present. And the problem is we don't know how the future is going to look like. Uh, and there's certainly a conflict between the now and the future. But it's also at the same time a little bit of a false dichotomy because many of the skills that you need to acquire now will be helpful in the future. But you need to be deliberate to acquire the um, skills and knowledge that you need to approve your exams and get your certifications. But also you need to be deliberate about acquiring skills that will help in the future. And I would say probably the main skill that we will need in the future, and we need to prepare now, is the ability to create networks. Trust networks, knowledge networks, personal networks. Yeah, so uh, as Niels Bohr said, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. Um, and one of the uh, w big challenges is, is what, what will the future be? And so I think 
there are some skill sets that you can have as learners that, that can prepare you for any sort of future and make you adaptable. And there are things that I think are maybe not hugely emphasized in medicine at present. They would be things like learning how to learn, um, how we actually, we're getting all this information now, critical thinking becomes even more important. Not just learning how to learn, but how do you unlearn things, which is a real challenge, particularly as we get more and more senior. And, uh, you know, I think even more distant in the future, we'll be seeing things like uh, robots doing surgery and all, more and more of these procedural skills will become robotic or automatic. So we really need to focus in on the human interaction because they're the jobs that will definitely be existing in the future. And unfortunately, a lot of the things that are required for that, I'm not sure we teach that well. Communication, leadership, how we achieve collective competence in a system. Uh, so they're big challenges. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think your question's a good one because often we lose the idea about the end in mind. And I know Catherine Lucy, who works at University of California, San Francisco, had a great quote, which is, at least at undergraduate level, often our educational processes, our pedagogy is sound, i.e. the way we do it, but our collective target is wrong. And I would suggest when we look around what people are doing, at least from where I sit, actually in undergraduate, in medical school, people are taking quite a leap in this regard. And I think they've got on board with the idea that we need to be preparing learners for systems thinking, we need to be changing curriculum around. I know of one medical school in Northeast US that has actually shifted their second and third year. So instead of doing two years of basic science and then two years of clinical, they do a year of basic science, then they just send them out to the wards and then they bring them back and do a bit more of their science and learning, and then they go back to the wards. One of the most interesting things about this was their supervisors didn't even notice. All right. <laughs> and so I think actually we're seeing medical schools doing a lot of innovations in this regard, but I think one of the gaps is then they're not necessarily connecting with the postgraduate learners, where I see many more fixed mindsets about how people are being prepared for practice. And the culture of the practitioners, I think, is overwhelming and then sort of defeats whatever innovations have been happening at medical school. And I think Walter would actually be a good person to comment on this because I think he also straddles this teaching medical students as well as postgraduate learners. And I certainly find there's a big sort of cultural uh, difference between the way they're approached. So I'd be interested in what you had to think about that. I couldn't agree more, and actually one of the things that's really resonating for me uh, in listening to the conversation is this notion of the individual and what the individual needs to bring to the, his own education and the team and the environment that's contributing to that. And in my mind, when I look at at least medical education in the United States, medical school prepares you to get into residency, which is probably where you learn to become a doctor. And that's such a fundamental aspect of your clinical training and which raises the question, who are you picking to go into residency? How uh, effective are the faculty at teaching you your clinical work and how effective is the workplace curriculum in promoting your learning? It's very interesting to me because I spend uh, a lot of my time doing research now looking at how residents learn from the work that they do every day. And when residents are picking a residency program, they generally look at the quality of the morning reports, the quality of the noon conferences, uh, the formal elements of their curriculum, and actually, it's what happens at night. It's what happens in the ED. It happen it's what happens at the patient's bedside when they're struggling with a procedure that really makes out their educational experience. So for me, I would shine a lot of light onto how doctors are learning from the work that they do every day. Jenny. Yeah, one of the uh, challenges for all of us as we do work every day now is the fact that when we used to work in stable teams and knew and worked with the same people every day, and some of you may still be able to do that, it's much easier to develop shared ideas, rules, norms, the way we work around here. But for the healthcare industry, as so many 
teams are increasingly not stable. So I think one of the things we have to think about for the future of clinical education is how do we bring the teamness with us? And so um, one of the biggest challenges is it's socially normal for us to all focus on clinical tasks. How do we get better at doing our expert things, whether it's ECMO, whether it's um, a procedure, whether it's starting a line, whether it's interviewing a patient? It's very socially abnormal to talk about the processes by which we do that. That is, what's um, Simon's way of doing it, or Chris's way, or Jenny's, and when there's a difference between them, how do we make that discussable? So one of the biggest difficulties is how do we learn to make the undiscussable discussable? Because as we're moving from team to team, we're inevitably going to violate each other's expectations. And we need to find a way to create a culture where we can talk about those things. And developing some self-reflection skills and the ability to narrate what one is thinking is really weird. We never learn that. And that's a skill that would be very portable into a variety of unfamiliar environments. I, if I may, I, I'm almost wondering if I might represent a contrarian viewpoint uh, in terms of what is discussable and not discussable. The, the term socially abnormal to me really lands on me in a way that makes me think, I must be socially abnormal because I talk about how I do things compared to my colleagues. Uh, like when I have a patient with X, Y, and Z condition, this is how I approach it. I know Chris may do it differently, but this is how I approach it. And these are conversations that I have with residents, in particular in regards to, I know that our group is very different, um, but this is how I approach it, and this is why. So I don't know what you think about that, but... Yeah. So I, I think it's... I think there are wonderful practitioners like you, Walter, like some other people I've met at this conference and who have presented at this conference who are changing the social norms about what can we be explicit about and what can we discuss. I use the term of art socially abnormal to help us appreciate that when you move from doing things the way everybody learned to do it in medical school or nursing school, like don't bring up the difficult topic, don't, don't rock the boat that uh, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything. All those good things our mommies taught us. When you try to start stepping outside of that, which you have done, you have certain superpowers now, Walter. You're able to do it by long practice and courage. I just want people to know that if they feel like it, there's a little boundary there, that was my reason for using the word socially abnormal, to really normalize that you can make that switch, but if it feels awkward, there's a reason. So. One of the things I think we just need to be mindful of is when we talk about the different tribes, and we talked a lot about tribes yesterday, um, there is going to be a natural tendency for this panel to talk about medical education, because that's our background. But actually, I think one of the things we need to really stop and consider is how we can learn and how we can um, cross-pollinate and steal stuff from other professions and how they work together. So, Sandra, you've done a lot of work in multi-professional training. I'm just wondering if you have any insights or thoughts about how other professions and how, as a multi-professional training team, we're moving forward into the future. Because things are changing. Yeah, well, I think um, to do a little bit of spaced repetition, we discussed this yesterday in the panel when Jesse actually made some excellent comment on interprofessional education, is that is that really what we're doing right now? Or are we just doing either nurses training with a few doctors in the room or paramedics with a few doctors or whatever we're doing? Um, so to do real interprofessional um, education where everybody has to bring something to the table or to the patient case, um, that is something that we're gonna have to design differently in the future, but I do think that one point to kind of tie a knot to the future and what you guys were just talking about is that, well, <clears throat> I'm not sure that um, when we talk about preparing our learners for the future, well, they are the future. They are the ones who are going to create the future. So if we want to facilitate that to happen, just take a look at our learners. Just sit and observe what are they doing, where are they, how have they been trained to gather knowledge through primary school, 
How have, how have they been taught to work together and build on that instead of us, as Daniel said, doing what we were taught 10, 15, 20 years ago, and that's our framework of how we do education. So just have a look at your learners, and I think SMAG is a great um, advocate for that because we are kind of innovative and we try to stay out there and pay attention to what's going on and who's doing something new and then build on that. Yeah, I think um, the whole issue of interprofessional education is very difficult. I mean, just to sort of raise a definition, learning from, with and about each other actually encompasses a big range of things. And yet again, I think it's got some barriers that we don't recognise, particularly at undergraduate level, having tried to create at least just medical and nursing exercises, it just comes down to the curriculum. Oh, we've got a Thursday afternoon, we've got a Wednesday morning, and unfortunately these really practical things get in the way, uh, and instead people just go, oh, you should do it. And we know we should do it, but unfortunately there are some very real barriers to getting it done. The other thing that I have found is that when we do that, it's so easy for it to become tokenistic. Oh, I'm a doctor, this is what doctors do. I'm a nurse, this is what nurses do. And it doesn't feel like we're really making progress as to how we work better together. Contrast that with what I find much easier, which is when we do say in situ simulation, in teams, uh, in some of the stuff we do in across patient journeys, where people are working together, so instead this becomes a reflection on how we work together better to create a better outcome for the patient. And so you sort of bring up the sort of tribal thing, and I think you are the sort of saying, we're going to, by stealth, address tribalism by getting people together, talking about how they work better together, really agonizing about the interfaces, or I think there is also a place for people actually having exercises directed at it explicitly and saying, here's some role modeling for what you do when you find yourself in that situation and you've just gone down a rabbit hole and here you find yourself in conflict with someone else. How can you extract yourself back out? And I think both of those uh, have a place. Following in uh, Victoria's idea, we are spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to train together. But I think the future may have for us something a little bit different. There may be no difference between providers and the lines between nurses and physicians and paramedics and pharmacists. It's probably blurring quite a bit right now, especially in the United States. And I, I think Jenny can, can uh, uh, talk about this more than I can do. But I think there's probably a paradigm in the future where everybody's going to train together and only some very specific skills or really specific knowledge will be the um, uh, thing that will differentiate providers. More than I'm a nurse or I'm a doctor, providers will be more like I'm an ECMO provider, I'm a critical care provider, without the last name of doctor, nurse, or a physical therapist. I don't know, Jenny, I think it's part of what you think. Well, I pathway to get there, I think, is part of the kind of work that Vic's been doing at Bond, which is focusing on the outcomes that we want. So I am sit at the Center for Medical Simulation, and we think a lot about how to create simulation experiences across our hospital system. And I think one of the things that we're, you know, uh, trying to adopt from looking at work like Vic's is focusing on competencies and focusing on fixing or addressing clinical benchmark issues. And why I think this is part of the future potentially is instead of thinking about it functionally, Daniel, I'm in this specialty, I'm in this specialty, I'm in this specialty, we may start working more like other industries such as uh, software and um, manufacturing where we're really looking at functional teams that produce something like a safe birth or a uh, quickly enough cathed um, heart patient who's come to our emergency department. And so what's really beautiful about that in terms of moving toward the future is it's possible that instead of our gating mechanisms being an OSCE and a board exam and all these other things, we might move more toward competency-based uh, assessment and, and gating go-no-go, -go, such as uh, Richard Resnick and his team in Canada have been doing, which produces a whole set of other problems in terms of staffing and whatnot for our hospitals that we could talk about. But I think moving toward functional competence may transform future okay. education. 
So that's a, that's a very helpful discussion and lots of interesting ideas about how we're moving forward. What I want to hear, because um, I'm selfish and I'm, somebody's ridiculously put me in charge, is some tangible ideas about what we can do next week, next month, in the next few months about how we do that. Now, the panel here will have some ideas, but I'm actually very interested in what the people in the audience think. So what I want you to do now is just turn to the person next to you and say, I'm trying to train the nurse, paramedic, clinician, pre-hospital provider of the future. What am I going to do differently in the next few months to make sure that they are prepared for their career in five or ten years' time? Or if you're doing something already, share that with us and send it through to the, the tweet session. So you want to do that for a couple of minutes now? We've been going for half an hour. We need an activity. It's a long day. So go for that. Have a chat to the person next to you. And how can you inspire the generation of the future? All right, we'll come back to the panel now. Um, it's great stimulated some discussion. So we're going to run down the panel and ask them for their one thing that they're going to be doing differently as well. Sorry, guys. Yeah, so I, I think that um, during this conversation with these excellent people, what I just realized from what Vic was saying that I actually think we can do interprofessional education um, better. And I, I know at my place what we do is a lot of peer-to-peer, -peer, and I think we could benefit from role modeling and have more seniors participate and role model in the interprofessional education for the undergraduate level. I'm going to go home and work on that. So how to prepare for the future? <laughs> how to prepare for the future? I will say to focus on things that machines can't do. Empathy and creativity. Uh, I'm going to go with the idea of addressing interfaces and complexity in care, and I'm going to suggest people go and find one other service they work with, choose one patient process that they share, and do a really simple simulation and talk about it. Uh, so for me, uh, in my context uh, with doctors who are often already um, fairly well advanced in their training, they're going to be the educators of the future. So uh, I'm going to try and role model uh, the concepts of, uh, of being humble about your knowledge, being able to need to demonstrate how to learn and keep learning, and also cr important skills like critical thinking and try and um, show the importance of communication and that we are all part of a team in terms of nurses, doctors, and that that's what really matters to the patient. Um, one of my main areas of education is faculty um, education within our hospital system. And what I'm going to keep working on is trying to walk our talk as we do curriculum design for simulation. And that is forcing our interprofessional team to actually listen to each other as we do curriculum design for interprofessional teams. So in addition to these great comments, I, I wonder if we could teach medical students, residents, nursing students, anyone in any health profession to ask themselves at the end of every day, what did I achieve? What didn't I achieve today? What did I do well? What did I not do well? And what am I going to do differently next time? I think if we trained our young learners to be reflective about their practice, they would help themselves improve. So the future is bright. Which is good. I'm going to move the panel on now, if it's OK, because I think there's quite a lot of expertise on the panel here around simulation. And at a conference like this, we've seen some amazing simulation. I mean, truly spectacular simulations going on, and both here and yesterday, and on the workshop days, which were fabulous. But simulation, it's not something we do every day. It is time consuming. It is technologically difficult at times. And it's sometimes a little bit easy for us just to say, oh, well, we'll do that through simulation. So I'm going to ask this panel, who have a lot of expertise in this area, and to challenge you to say, 
is simulation really delivering at the moment? Is it really making a change to how people perform? And is it really making a change to patient outcomes? So I, if I could chime in on that, I, I think uh, there's an interesting dilemma when we think about simulation, because very much we're focused on how the simulation prepares you for your work. And as part of my own PhD journey uh, in Maastricht, I'm working with uh, a gentleman called Pim Tunison, who's one of my supervisors. And he's really shifted my thinking about simulation. And how can simulation prepare us to better learn from the work that we're doing? And to give you a concrete example would be the type of insight to simulations that a lot of people are doing and then doing a quick debriefing so that people learn to reflect so that when they have a moment in their clinical work that they can then reflect better together. So I think there's two ways of thinking, simulation preparing you for your work or simulation preparing you to learn from the work that you're doing. I wanted to just address uh, one kind of technical issue that you raised there, Simon, and then a, a bigger question, which is, does it actually impact patient outcomes? And just as it's very difficult to assess whether uh, learning a new procedure in the long term affects patient outcomes because there's risk adjustment and all these other problems, uh, we have to look at an extremely granular level, and that's where I think Again, I'm going to refer back to the work Vic's doing and some other in-situ programs that are designed at specific targeted areas. An article just came out last week on the benefits of doing certain kinds of perinatal and uh, labor and delivery simulations for survivals of new infants and moms. And so there's a lot of targeted stuff. There's just, you can't say, does education help patient outcomes? Similarly, you can't say, does simulation help patient outcomes? You could say, does this simulation on how to do a central line reduce nosocomial infections in the following context? We have to be as specific as we require ourselves to be in other outcome studies. Um, so I, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I, in, in case anybody wants to respond, and then I have a couple other thoughts later. Yeah, no, I'm happy to pick up on that, and I think can't reinforce it enough. Simulation is just become such a catch-all term, and I think to take a ridiculous extreme, it's sort of like saying, does PowerPoint have outcomes? And of course the answer is, well, it depends what you do with it. And so just the same with simulation. And I guess in my role, and the role of most simulation educators, sure, it might be to provide simulation, but I think it mainly is to facilitate the appropriate use of simulation within the context in which you're asked to deliver it. So to give a sort of practical example, uh, in our, at our simulation service, and we call it a simulation service, not a centre, uh, we, because we deliberately see ourselves as being a consultation. So operating theatre comes to us and says we want to run a sim on a massive uh, hemorrhage in obstetric theatre, and we think we want to do this. And I say, well, hang on, what do you want to achieve? And we'll give you an expert opinion on how you can achieve that through simulation. Similarly, some people just want to do procedural skills training, and that's fine. There's some fabulous things, and that's something where there is good evidence about the simulation modality leading to improved skill acquisition. I think when you're targeting, and, and Jenny sort of made reference to some of those patient outcomes things, of course you can achieve anything, but not everything. So, for example, yes, I've had a couple of programs where we have improved our times to cath lab, our times to CT scan in trauma, our times to getting to interventional radiology and stroke. These time-based targets, surprise, surprise, if you practice them, you get better at them. And pretty much everybody who works in critical care knows that. And I think simulation has a place for that, but then you also got to send that to the CEO and go, yep, we're doing a good job, and then make sure they pay for the other stuff that's much harder to demonstrate the outcome, like are people being more respectful when they're doing their interfaces and their handovers between ED and the operating theatre team? Are people actually thinking about others' perspectives when they're having a discussion about should we go to interventional radiology, should we go to theatre, should we go to CT? So I think... Simulation has a role for all of those things. Yes, it can have outcomes. Some of them will be easy to measure, not all of them. But I think my overall thing is for simulation experts to be seeing themselves as helping simulation occasionalists do a much better job of what they do. So that was one of the questions I was um, interested in is with the simulation, and, and this is a group of, of an experts, and uh, you know, the amount of brains you guys have got around this is incredible. 
But what about people who are doing this on an ad hoc basis, who are just getting in there and saying, oh, I'm going to get a mannequin out and I'm going to do some simulation, when we're doing it in professional, well-centered, well-designed systems, great. Are there harms, risks, and balances here that we need to consider? So just echoing a little bit about uh, what Victoria said there, I really liked where you said, we're not a simulation center, we're a simulation service. And in Australia a few years ago, I think a big mistake was made when a lot of resources were put into simulation, but it was put specifically into centers that often are empty and turn into storehouses for simulation equipment. And the equipment is really, you know, a tiny part of the puzzle because it's the ability to deliver effective simulation that is the, the, the real challenge. And we talked a lot about in our simulation workshops on Monday, I guess, this concept of functional task alignment. And it's quite easy to just throw a mannequin out there and get a bunch of people around and start punching it with, with uh, needles and trying to cannulate it and stuff like that. But we really need to think about whenever we do simulation, what our learning objectives are and just making sure that what we're doing matches that. And so that may actually just involve a bit of a toilet roll and a scalpel to practice um, uh, a, a surgical cricothyroidotomy, or it may need a simulated patient, as we saw demonstrated really well yesterday. Or it may not need simulation at all. Uh, maybe you just want to have someone observe a ward round and comment on what happens. So uh, that, I think that's a really key concept we need to think about. Um, also to echo on what you guys just said and something that I really advocate for is that the f to tie that back to our first subject that the future of sim is not a sim center but a simulation service or maybe even a safety service where you look at the critical incidents at your hospital or you can actually have a um, safety consult from whatever event happened at your ward, and the um, education, safety, and simulation experts in your place or the place you collaborate with can come and observe, come and, and plan what is actually going to help fix it. And sometimes the answer is going to be sim. Sometimes it's going to be something completely different. One last thing that I think is important is uh, Everybody said basically the same thing, that we need to incorporate simulation into every part of the threat of healthcare. And more like electricity is part of you know, this big grid of what we do in society. But what I think is important and we forget is probably we need to teach all learners and all faculty, not only the ones focused on simulation, some basic simulation skills. And the reason is, number one, they can recognize issues and problems that are you know, good for a simulation uh, intervention. If they don't have the basic tools, they just don't know. And the other thing is, with basic simulation tools and skills, uh, they can develop a constant micro in situ sort of simulation approach to the problems. So I think that is helpful in the, in the big picture of education about simulation. And yes. I think there's a, there's a sort of other way around of looking at that, I totally agree with what you're saying, but to pick up on something Walter was saying, also we've got to take the lessons from simulation into our real world, and certainly Walter and Jenny have both influenced me about this, and I've recently been sitting back and thinking about these wonderful in situ simulations that I run, and I go, hang on, in my emergency department, 300 patients come through the doors every day and I have to create a fake one so we can have a conversation about our performance? I mean, what is that? And I, so I think, as well as learning about simulation, what we should be doing is taking the expertise that the real debriefing experts have taught us and thinking, how do we create those short, reflective coaching conversations? Walter's published about this. Uh, how do we actually get people to say, OK, let's just stop right there. How did that go? Whether we do a plus delta or whatever technique, have a short script and be able then to move on and get people to learn from their work. So I'd be interested in both Jenny and Walter's sort of thoughts on that. It's critical, I think, for simulation in the new world. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And the thing that 
uh, jumps out at me in listening to your conversation is this notion of simulation service, simulators, mannequins that are empty, investments in physical space. And um, what I'd love to throw into the discussion is the investment in the people who are doing the training. And uh, I'm trying to imagine the uh, critical care teams who are doing ECMO at their institutions, and it would be inconceivable to buy equipment for ECMO and to put it in a room and expect people to use it without any training. And this is what happens in simulation. And despite the fact that in other arenas, educators are trained and certified to do their work, think about the uh, secondary education in Finland, for example, which is recognizably the best in the world. They professionalize teacher training. And unfortunately, we're still in a place where um, it is ad hoc. And I think we need to recognize that there are specific skills involved in using simulation as an educational strategy, much like there are specific skills involved in taking a patient and putting them on ECMO. So you can just take a little pause there for a second, because I'm quite interested in the audience. Um, how should we do this? Let's get you to put your hand up if you, well, just start by putting your hand up. That's the easy part, if you can. So just keep your hand up if you, keep your hand up if you've been involved in in-situ simulation this year. Keep your hand up if you do in-situ simulation on a, m more than twice this year. Keep your hand up if you do it on a monthly basis. Weekly basis? OK, so the rest of you work in a sim center. Um, <laughs> sorry, a sim service. God, I haven't been listening. Um, that's kind of interesting. What, do you th what does the panel think about those, those numbers there? Because what, what that seems to talk to me is that the penetrance out there isn't as frequent as perhaps we would like and how that works in, do we need it to be incredibly common, or are the people who are doing this on a relatively infrequent basis contaminating others with their skills and their learning? Which I think on those numbers is possibly the way that we're going to have to move. Your, your implication in your question is that it's the learners who benefit from those inside your simulations. And of course, the learners should be one of the beneficiaries, but if it is that you are testing the system of how do you get a patient from ED to interventional radiology in a timely way via CT scan and with all the people involved, that is a very resource intensive simulation. It will have massive impacts in terms of how you interrogate your systems, your communication processes, and people will learn stuff, but that's not the main thing. So I think those sort of sims, they are resource intensive, and, we, and when we do that, we take resources away from direct patient care, and we've got responsibilities to both. I think what I I would like to think is that we now do smaller, far less ambitious things complementing that, that maybe are more directed on the learning. And I think even recognizing and the frequency I suspect is just simply because this is actually quite hard to do, which is why, again, I go back to it, I think we should be practicing our skills at getting more from the patients we see and thinking about short coaching conversations rather than necessarily having to create new ones. Yeah, we had an epiphany one morning when um, we were, we'd set up at 8 o'clock in the morning to do a simulation, and the red phone went off. And, okay, well, there's a patient coming in, so all right, we have to cancel the session. And we had this epiphany, and we went, that's insane. Why are we canceling the session? We've we'll got our debriefers there, we've got the observers, we've got the video. We didn't do the video because we're not allowed. But we actually just ran it, and that was a huge learning experience for us, that you can deliver all of those skills, exactly what you're talking about, in the clinical setting. And it's much more powerful, actually. Yeah, I have had a really bad experience of doing that, but that's oh, maybe okay. for the morning tea. <laughs> we can talk about it later. Depends on how the patient goes, shall we say. Indeed. Chris. Yeah, so uh, it, it is a good question, like uh, what's the right dose and what's the timing of insight to <laughs> simulation? And it's so varied in terms of what you're trying to achieve, like I think what Vic said. Um, uh, I, I think one of the other things, I'd, so I, I've done it before, where how many of those simulations actually involved consultants or like the expert members of the team rather than just the junior members of the team? And I, I think that's one of the things that we need to do more of is actually having our, our experts involved to one role model the management of the, the clinical situations, 
but two, to also role model how we actually learn and that it's okay to fail and maybe make mistakes and get feedback and, and get better. But then also that other key aspect of actually developing processes and testing the environment, uh, because that's where I think there's potential to really start linking it to process of the system process of care and also potentially patient outcomes. And do you think there are barriers to that at the moment? There's massive barriers, and I think they're probably fairly um, obvious to many people, but I might let some other people comment on them. So um, I think one of the areas that simulation is greatly underutilized for is rectifying and addressing current trends in whatever your hospital or clinic or settings quality and safety big problems are. And um, to me, the, if we want to have SIM embedded in the future and in a robust way, I completely support my colleagues thinking that simulation is really just a Trojan horse to allow us to get people together to reflect and, uh, on their skills and try to get them better. But I'd like to give an example of how that might happen and how that can be funded and then think with the rest of you about how could we extrapolate that to other situations where we could really be practicing either with our real patients. So part of the problem is there's huge uh, financial pressures on everybody's healthcare system almost in every part of the world. And so the idea of taking time to actually coach yourself or get a coach or get better at what you do is not right now built in. In our system at Harvard, we have a captive insurer called Crico Risk Management Foundation. And the really interesting thing is, Crico's decided it is in their financial interest, because unlike most insurance companies that make money on your money, uh, it, captive insurers uh, do better financially when patient care is better, because there are less claims. So our entire faculty simulation program is funded through a malpractice discount for all the physicians within the Harvard system who go through simulation and learn to uh, communicate more effectively. Our entire program is around speaking up, um, uh, having a clear team leader, and then we do have a couple technical issues like massive transfusion protocol. But the insurer is paying us to teach people to communicate better because their actuarial data show that um, adverse events go down when people can actually talk to each other. Um, most adverse events involve somebody knew something was happening wrong but didn't speak up. So that's the big problem that we are trying to address. So the question is, we've got somebody giving money to the physicians to do this in the form of a discount. And the question is, how can we embed uh, cost avoidance or cost benefit analysis in the way that your colleague, uh, Mr. Barsik, has been doing at Northwestern in a way that will allow us to embed coaching and real-time reflection for any of our services, whether it's simulation or otherwise. Simulation's just an occasion to reflect and learn. Yeah, so I think this <coughs> brings up issues of funding, but also issues of governance. And I think if we're looking for targets of our simulation, we have to be well connected. It comes back to Sandra's comment, really, about is it a safety service? Is it a simulation service? But we have really tried to connect with our adverse event reporting, our, our critical incident committee, and sort of look to direction. I mean, you can't just say, this is our problem, we'll fix it, because there's something simulation just doesn't fix. So I think it does come down to leadership governance. I think what you say also, just from another health system point of view, your funding model for your simulation is entirely um, has to be integrated with the funding model for your health service. Yeah. So the reason I'm really interested in the coaching conversations is because actually that's the time that we have discretionary in our clinical world. And I think we're used to thinking, how do we do bedside teaching? How do we do other things? How can we make the most from that learning? So it does need to be short, but I think that's what we've got. To separate this out and so-called disaggregate education and service, I think other people have tried to do that, but you never get back what you had when you had a synergy, and I think that comes back to the original point about learning. So I guess if it's all right, I'd like to hear from some of the panel. If you were doing one of these coaching conversations after not a bad incident, just a performance or an occasion of practice, 
what would your coaching conversation look like in that four to five minutes? And I'm looking at Walter and Sandra because I suspect you guys have both done some of these. So, Well, my mind was somewhere else. Okay, right now. Right, I'll start with Walter because I know he's got one, but you come back to it. Yeah. I, I think it depends in oh. many ways. Um, I think it depends on what the, the, the instance is and it depends on if I've already had a conversation with that person. Um, when I'm having a really good day, right, everyone has good days and bad days, if I'm working with a pediatric emergency medicine fellow, at the beginning of the shift I ask them, if you have a really sick patient today in the trauma room, what are you focusing on and what do you want me to watch for? And then when we have a really sick patient in recess, and the fellow is engaging in, in this way or that, afterwards the conversation looks very different than it would if it was an emergent learning opportunity uh, that we hadn't thought about in advance. So there's lots of different things that impact it, but I will tell you, I approach those conversations almost the same way I approach a debriefing. And I think this is one of the things I was bringing up before, which is simulation can prepare people to learn from their practice and they, the, the uh, residents, at least, I work with, when I work with them in simulation, they know how I'm going to approach them in clinical practice, and they're used to my way of talking. Like, hey, I saw you do this, this is what I'm thinking, what were you going for? That sort of, that sort of thing. So now I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, so two things. First of all, I think that advocating for let's talk together is really important. And so instead of just talking together when we do something really amazing or something really shitty. We should just talk on a daily basis. And that way, and, and, and treat it like a debriefing so that you get into a habit of every event, good, bad, normal. Being debriefed creates a culture of us talking about our performance, and that way you can design short clinical debriefings um, that is actually um, and then you can actually do it. There, we all know that simulation can, and most times are time demanding. And that is a barrier we have for when we want to deliver it and do it um, at our hospitals or pre hospital And so that's why I think that talking together on a daily basis creates a culture where we talk together, together where we talk about our clinical practice, and that makes it so much easier to talk about those two and a half percent. And then I think one thing we need to bring into the discussion of what you said, that it's only a few of us who works in very big sim centers. So when we discuss this topic, we also have to remember that most of us are going to go back to our service and maybe be responsible for running simulation that doesn't have a backup sim center or a huge program. And so to to figure out ways where you can actually make that happen without a lot of massive, uh, without a lot of resources. And I think that what we've talked about earlier is that show that you can do this. Re simulation as a field um, has improved dramatically in the way we do research and how we report outcomes and remembering the patient-related outcomes. So when we do design SIM back home in a small escape, remember to incorporate patient outcome so you can report something that will give you money. I'm wondering if I could just chime in on something for two minutes. Uh, one of the things I, that strikes me is that we talk about simulation as if all simulation looks the same. Um, and I think simulation look, can look very different and has many different flavors. And I think there's this, um, foregrounding or privileging of mannequin-based, team-based simulations. But let me give you a contrary example, something that we're doing in our emergency department that is also simulation, which is having a simulation procedure cart. So when residents are going to be doing a lumbar puncture, the, the fellow who's going to be supervising that procedure quickly sits down with that person, they drape the patient, they practice and also practice, hey, this, let's coach, I'm going to coach you through this, so that when they actually go do the procedure, the resident has practiced the procedure, but they've actually practiced coaching them through the procedure. Same with suturing. Um, so I think this notion of just-in-time simulation, even for little tiny things that are embedded in the work that we do, are potentially quite powerful yeah. too. And I just want to throw that in there because it's not only large, resource-intensive team-based simulations that, that qualify here. 
So just to move us on a little bit, because otherwise in this panel we'll stay on simulation until Thursday next week. But we'll revert. We don't worry. We're coming back to simulation shortly. It would um, be good, though. It would be <laughs> fabulous. No, I mean, I'd, I'd just do a whole conference. Um, Jesse, Twitter, any news or thoughts? There's a phenomenal amount of questions coming through, and, and all, a lot of them require really nuanced answers. So I'm going to actually com compile and collate them all and share them out to the group um, afterwards so that we can actually try and keep some conversation going about it. Um, Walter, Walter's comments then really segue to a nice, I guess, prevailing thing of how in resource uh, tight environments where the priority from a um, health dollar point of view is service delivery, how do we kind of deal with the fact that as educators a lot of our time is spent working on the recalcitrant, like the expectation that it's our job to motivate learners um, and as opposed to going down performance management. Can you just restate the last, can you restate the last bit again? So, so, so I guess it's the, uh, a lot of the audience are interested in the, with the pressures of education and the fact that we've acknowledged a lot of the, the skills that we're, we're talking about of educators having those specific skills of actually debriefing and a range of other things, a lot of performance management gets thrown back to education. So, I, paraphrasing, we keep trying to teach pigs to sing. How do we actually shift that away from the role of the educator so we can get on, on with working with the people that I actually wonder if that's um, a nice segue into one of the next sections that we were going to talk about, and we were talking about this earlier, Vic, is this idea of when we're training educators for careers and when we're trying to value careers in education, how do you become recognized in the same way that you might do as if you're a researcher, whether actually becoming an educator is about there in the moment teaching things, or whether it's more about leadership and organizational change and interaction. Yeah, uh, you're right, we were talking about this, and I think uh, I would take the example of those who come, and we, I've now had 10 years of people coming and doing either medical education registrar or medical education fellow jobs with me. So these are people that just like they go and do ultrasound or something like that, you come and spend six or 12 months, and in fact, there's a few of them in the audience. And most of them arrive thinking, I'm going to learn to know how to switch on the simulator. I'm going to learn how to do great bedside teaching. I'm going to give a great talk. And most of them at the end of it had come away going, actually, I think I spent this time learning how to change things. And so I think there is a huge thing that the career development of the medical educator or health professional educator of any sort should be about leadership and change management because certainly reflecting on my own career, that's been the thing that's made the difference. Yes, I've picked up some of those other skills and continue to get them, but the ability to influence others and to create change has been magnitudinally different in terms of the impact on both patient care and our educational outcomes. Jesse's question, I think, is a good example of that because I think that involves us having an educational sort of uh, mindset that is big picture. And one of the issues with simulation is people come to simulation from clinical world and simulation. They don't come to it through education, and I feel like I was kind of lucky to sort of do it that way because only if you've got good educational principles can you deliver good simulation face-to-face. Uh, -face. So your question about what do we do? The first thing is an educator should say is, well, let's make a diagnosis first. Can pigs ever sing? No. In which case, then let's stop trying to train and let's think about whatever they are, HR processes, other things, to get rid of that person because they shouldn't be there. But maybe the diagnosis is something different, which is, you know, this is a pig that's shown some promise, but they've got a few problems right now. I think we can still make them sing. In which case, work out what are those problems, make a good diagnosis again, and then uh, prescribe the appropriate educational interventions that will make a difference. And I think that's the expertise, but that involves, I think, a mindset that is, let's think about this strategically, let's have processes not just for this learner, but for learners in the same position. So I think that sort of comes down to how do you set up that, but also thinking about that sort of career development. And I know Chris sort of wrote to me a few years ago saying, what should I do and what courses? And we had a similar kind of conversation, didn't we? Yeah, and, and that's one of the tricky things is uh, if you're wanting to be a 
clinician educator, at least in Australia, is how, how do you do that? It's really not clear to me, um, and trying to figure that out. And one of the things that I'm interested in creating now is a clinician educator network to help um, promote the role and also share the, figure out what the skill set is, what it, how you can get that skill set, and hopefully also start to look at doing research into the future. Um, I was just thinking back to that question about the, um, the sort of recalcitrant trainee and uh, I sometimes wonder if the, like often there's a problem in the clinical service and it's like, well, we need to educate them more. And you know, I think we sometimes forget actually how limited education can be sometimes and that there's often much better ways, as you say, in terms of fixing a problem, whether that's either by looking at your recruitment, looking at just how the system works, um, cognitive forcing strategies uh, and whatever. So it's actually figuring out what is the stuff that education should be trying to tackle. So it's a bit like putting resilience training into a system which actually is just brutalizing doctors and nurses and paramedics. If your system is completely broken, then putting some resilience training in is not the solution. It's good. <laughs> Daniel. So what we're talking about right now is what are the skills and what are the tools that clinical educators need to have. But the main problem is we have no way to measure the impact that we have in systems because we all the great impact that we may have a system usually gets absorbed within HR and gets absorbed with um, practice and gets absorbed within safety. And the due credit that is uh, given, there's no due credit given to the education part of the system. So I think our challenge, uh, the way to justify our existence is to create a measure to, a way to measure our impact, our impact in real life. Okay, now if we go back to the beginning and we heard Natalie, one of the questions that she was asked and she was a little bit unclear about is whether or not she's any good. Which is a very powerful question. I don't know whether you have ever asked this, if you just sort of sit in the mirror one day, do, am I actually any good at what I do? And key to that is this issue of assessment about how do we know whether people have achieved and how do we know they're improving and how do we know they're getting any better? So the question I've got for the panel is whether our current methods of assessment are fit for purpose and what's the future of how we assess? I'm always happy to fill a space, you know that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh no, Jenny, you go for yeah, it. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to put out kind of a question to the panel and perhaps we could also hear back from the audience on this, Simon, if you think mm. it's fruitful or not. So I uh, recently had someone in uh, one of my courses who had trained with Richard Resnick in Canada, and as many of you know, he's been one of the world leaders in trying to see if you could develop an entirely competency-based residency program. His, in his case, was surgery. And they had a huge amount of success with it. They really had a way of moving people through. Basically, it wasn't the number of procedures. It wasn't the amount of years. It was you basically demonstrated your competency with a set of roughly 20 uh, different things, depending on the subspecialty within surgery. And uh, what this colleague told me in the course two weeks ago, is she said it was working fantastically for the learners, but the hospital hated it <laughs> because all these residents that they had for free work were you know, graduating out or were learning. And so they weren't available to do all the work needed in the hospital. And so to me, I think one of the things that we have to figure out is if we created much more efficient work-based assessment processes, similar to what Richard Resnick and colleagues have been doing, it has huge ripple effects for other parts of the system. Um, and so I think assessment of the future can be in situ, competency-based, and would certainly save the learners a lot of time and money. The challenge is how do we get the rest of the system to adjust? And, um, Hold that thought, because I think okay. this is a, you're, you're quite right, and thanks for the reminder that we need to ask this, the audience, really. So again, can you just talk to the person next to you? And on those particular issues, many of you will be doing things like workplace-based assessments. So I've got two questions for you. 
The first is, honestly, and you can speak to the person next to you, or you can just do it self-reflectively. Are you any good, and how do you know? That's the first question. And the second question is, your experience of doing assessments in the workplace, workplace-based assessments of whatever nature you call them, are they working for you? Do you feel they're a good measure of your competency at the moment? So have a chat to the person next to you and think, first question, are you any good? Right. How did you guys get on with the uh, the first question? So we can we can do a little we can do a little Dunning Kruger experiment here if you like. So can you all put your hands up in the air again, please? It's probably the best way to do this. If you just bob your hands up in the air, and keep your hand up if you're above average. <laughs> I didn't say above average at what. I mean, so I'm sure you're all above average at something. Um, so thanks for that. Um, how did you find that conversation? Was that useful? Was it, was it challenging, that first question? Has, have you ever stopped to think about it? And um, Vic and I were just talking, and um, I think our conclusion came to the same thing, wasn't it? So how do you know you're any good? Yeah, I, I think it is very hard to know you're any good. I think I have an idea about strengths and weaknesses that I have, but I was just telling Simon I was so influenced by a recent Don't Forget the Bubbles post about supervision and, and the idea when this trainee had gone to do a mental health attachment, how they had this very formal process where they just sat and talked about their practice. So I'm inspired by it, and I go and actually talk to one of my colleagues who I respect, who's about the same age as me, and I said, how would you feel once a fortnight we sit down for an hour and I talk through some cases I do? And he was, A, very chuffed to be asked, and B, I'm going to trust his opinion, so I'll let you know next year how it's gone, but I'm bravely happy to go there. Chuffed is an underused word in the world. <laughs> Jesse, thoughts from the Twitter sphere? Thoughts from the Twitter sphere on this. It's not a hell of a lot bubbling back in from their own measures of, um, measures of self because they were so busy talking to each other. So let's just see if it's... If it's I, uploaded I can, yet. Uh, make a comment time. just while you're doing some searching there, Jesse, because yep. I, I think that uh, the critical thing is just like how self-deluded we all are, uh, at, you know, the Dunning-Kruger effect, um, and uh, that we have these incredible blind spots about our own performance or behaviour. We only see through our own eyes, so we need to really and it's really hard to do. We have a lot of like psychological immunity, as I'm sure Jenny would, would comment on more, to actually seek out feedback and how to actually learn from feedback, um, I think is uh, a real challenge as a human being. So one absolutely stellar response from Casey Parker is, are you any good? How do you know? Ask your patients. Actually seek feedback from other specialists and teams. Mm. Thank you. Similar uh, following uh, Casey's idea, it's important to get feedback also from your learners. And talking to Victoria is important if you're going to do that, having feedback from your learners, you need to do it fairly consistently. Because one, your learners need to know they need to be prepared for that. If you just go to them at the end of the shift, they're very tired, the feedback will be due, oh, it was a fan shift. And you know, you can get a whole lot from that and consistently in trying to get feedback from your junior learners, your senior learners, sometimes our nurses. I typically ask the nurses uh, about this kind of stuff too. Can I, um, can I say something? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to swear on stage. No. Yeah. No. Yes. OK, then. Assessment is a bitch. Is, okay. that, is that a swear word? It, well. <laughs> in, de in Denmark, yeah. <laughs> I'm not loose. <laughs> Amongst ladies. Um, so Gender assessment issue. is really difficult. So being someone who consumes learning, I really don't like it. Um, I can do an OSCE or take an exam or some other kind of objective test. And I can be pleased when I pass it, because then, ooh, off, <laughs> done with that. But it doesn't really show what I'm good at or if I can do it at all. On the other side, we have competency-based or work-based assessment, which has the potential to be great. But the people who are using the tools and doing it, they need to be really, really, really 
good at it and have a really good control over themselves, their emotions, and the process of giving feedback or doing the assessment, because it is so subjective. It's so easy to be, to be influenced by context, by person, and by the mood on the day. And I know we're supposed to not do that, but I'm not sure we train our educators to actually use those tools. So being a learner in that process is really, really vulnerable. So some of the things we talked about have been really rather formative. And yeah, I'm going to put you guys on, on stage and say we do have to actually sometimes make some hard and fast decisions about whether people are good enough. And that level of assessment is challenging. Now, we've got new technologies, we've got new ideas, we've got new strategies. But are we fit for purpose as we stand? You know, it, 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 it's interesting. I would think in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. Uh, you know, I think a lot about workplace-based assessment and this notion of directly observing people's performance. And now this is something that happens periodically to me when I'm in the, in working a shift in, in the ED. A resident will come up to me and say, can you watch me take a history or watch me do an exam? And then I fill out that portion of the sheet and then we sit down and we, we chat, which is, um, as Sandra was saying, requires training, requires understanding the form, requires understanding what I should be watching for, uh, requires understanding about how I should have a conversation to coach to coach someone, and I think that is um, probably something we're not doing it enough of. So I think it would be fit for purpose if we were prepared to do that well. And I think in many instances, in many ways, it's just a tick box exercise. Mm -hmm. And one thing that, that really jumped out at me was a, a, a resident approaching me, well-intentioned, to say, this is my last day on the rotation. I need to get one of these things done. Would you mind filling it out? I'm like, well, we could do it in a little bit. I'm leaving at five, uh, so we have about two hours left. So the whole purpose of this exercise is for um, her or him to have me watch, for me to provide feedback so that they can then take that feedback and feed it forward so that they can improve. The other thing that comes to mind when I think about workplace assessment is something that uh, one of my surgical colleagues at Northwestern is doing, and he's created an app to assess surgical residents. And after every surgical procedure, there's a quick 30-second thing that the consultant surgeon or attending surgeon can complete on that resident. So rather than having a, just a, a small number of data points on a particular learner, there are many, many, many data points. And I think it's sort of like the pixels on a TV screen. The more pixels you have, the sharper the image is. And I think we need to be thinking about uh, that too. So smaller, more frequent, tiny bits of assessment. Yeah, and I'd like to pick up on that. I think as a concept. The thing about assessment is that it is a science. A lot of what we do in medical education actually is an art, and there's lots of ways to do it, but I think we're quick to ignore that uh, assessment actually is a science. It depends on things like reliability through sampling, which is what you just talked about, get lots and lots of data points, validity, which is assessing the right things the right way, and you know, you're asking that about, well, did you have to write a short answer question before you did your uh, go and look after the trauma patient? Well, no, but that's a classic example where we haven't matched the modality to what it is that we are assessing. So good assessment is a programmatic approach. It's multi-method and multi-modal. And actually, you see that quite well at academic institutions and people who are expert on stuff like where is the cut score. They do a good job of the science of assessment. And I think, actually, as clinicians, sometimes we lose a bit of respect for that when we go in and, our, in particular, some of our specialist colleges like to go, yeah, yeah, but I reckon a ski is a really good way to test people. Well, actually, there's science about this and we do need to sort of listen to people and this is another in fact intertribal conflict that sometimes I find myself in the middle of is these hardcore assessors saying but you need a nine point like at scale if you're going to do that mini CEX and I'm going come on we really want to find the true negatives that's all why do we need a nine point scale and so I think this idea about getting that expertise to help us with our assessment, but it's so vital because as Daniel kind of said, we're going to have so many different pathways to how we get to the endpoint, that the endpoint really needs to be well described and the measures of it need to be very robust. And then we can have this sort of more competency-based or people in the workplace, whatever they're doing, as long as it's very clear what those endpoints are. So I guess this is a sort of shout out for 
yes, the educators are actually really good, we just have to know how to talk to them and get the expertise into the valid things that we need to be uh, assessing. So I think one of the things you just raised was what do we actually do when we have a performance management problem? And I think this links to your earlier point, um, Jesse, which was, um, you know, developmental challenges or people who aren't quite cutting it or are getting turfed to the education team. So I think one of the things we have to think about is how do we develop the um, basically social interaction infrastructure for people to have the courage to have the difficult conversations that they need to have. So performance improvement process requires my having something to assess against and to say, look, uh, you've practiced outside the standard of care for the fifth time now, and here's the consequences if that continues, and here's the support that the organization is gonna provide you to get there. But the problem is, Everybody's shit scared to have difficult conversations. Even if you have training in it, you don't want to do it. Combine that with the fact that it's in the organization's interest. Uh, in my world, organizational behavior, there's an, even a theory to explain it called institutional theory. It's in the organizational's interest to make all the difficult assessment. Are you doing ethics compliance? Are you, do you have the correct sexual harassment? Uh, policies and procedures? Are you actually training the, trainer, training the learners the way you should? It's best for them to keep that entirely ceremonial because that's very efficient and you can just get the throughput. And if you actually have to assess people and you have to have the difficult conversations, it's extremely time consuming. So I think that's where the three things we've talked about today, real time coaching and in situ learning, simulation and assessment could really come together, but it requires a leadership commitment to have a deliberately developmental process where, hey, Chris, uh, you know what, I know this sucks, I, I really, I hate this just as much as you do, but I really need you to give me some feedback on how I did on the last shift, and he has to develop his muscles to be able to do that so that when he has the performance improvement conversation with me, he can do it. And so this taking everything we do as a developmental opportunity lets us hold people to high standards while, you know, helping them get there in a kindly way. There is that issue that if the only time that you speak to your trainees is when you're having a difficult conversation with them and you're not having a conversation with them about the regular stuff which you were talking about and when they've done great things, you're not doing a great job. Right. So one thing that uh, resonates for me, Jenny, in your comments and the comments of the panel is this notion about having conversations with learners, initiating conversations, giving feedback, which I have to be quite frank, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, having an allergic reaction to the term giving feedback, much like I might give Chris my book. Mm -hmm. And it's not giving an object, it's having a conversation that is a two-way street. And actually more than just sharing information with a learner, it's about feedback uh, re recipients, receiving feedback, processing feedback, and then seeking feedback. So the implication of this emerging science on feedback is I think we need to prepare people to receive feedback. So why aren't we training medical students and residents to seek feedback and receive feedback more effectively? Very much, and I'm big into faculty development, unfortunately there's too much emphasis on helping faculty give feedback when actually what we need to be doing is helping people receive the feedback and process the feedback that's actually around them every single day. Amen, brother. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that really resonates with me. We did a session um, in Denmark last week on uh, learning from feedback and there was one or two people in the room who put their hand up that anyone had ever given them any teaching at all about how to actually learn from it. We're, we're putting a lot of emphasis on how to give it, but there's feedback all around us that we need to learn how to learn from. So, yeah, I thought it was a really great point. And I just killed the panel discussion. Oh, no, yeah. I, well, I <laughs> we have one minute. Don't clock it. Uh, no, no, actually, I think that clock is wrong. 
Actually, so we have a few more minutes. So, but so Jesse, anything else you want to bring to the table? Well, I guess just starting to move towards the inevitable close, there was a question posed really at the front end of this, which um, was, what will the effect of dust smack be on um, medical education or healthcare professional education in Germany? Mm, I'm not sure we're qualified to answer, yeah. as there are no Germans on the panel. Well, extrapolate, I think. <laughs> it's a really good question. Yeah. It's a really it's good right? question that we don't actually understand a lot of the impact of a conference like this. Yeah. And if you want well, my personal opinion, I think conferences like this now, and in fact medical education in general, is moving much more towards a, med a, much more towards a musical model. In the, in the old days, we used to control content, and people used to come to a conference to hear about content and hear about stuff and hear about you. We can disseminate that very easily now. We've got the internet. It's good. What you come here for, or part of the world of social media and foam in general, is about a shared experience. It's about getting inspired about things. It's about the ability to learn that, oh, that could be interesting. I'm going to go away and find about more about it, and I'm going to talk to friends and make new friends and make new contacts. Taylor Swift does not make money from selling albums anymore. They're basically free on Spotify. Actually, she's not on Spotify, which is why I moved to Apple Music. She but, is. She is oh, is she back? Yeah. Oh, right, okay, I can get back on then. Um, big fan. Um, she makes money from the experience, the association, and from the concerts. And there is something about medical education which is about this shared experience. So if you want the answer personally, from Desmac, because nobody else jumped in, is I think this is about the experience and the sharing of ideas and inspiration. Yeah, I think to sort of add to that, that things like this, and it's not my original quote, they give you something to, th they don't tell you what to think, they tell you what to think about. Yes. So I think we've heard a lot of uh, topics, clinical topics, and people should, as Scott and others have encouraged us to go away and do your own reading, do your own reality testing, is this right? And I think that's a metaphor across all the sort of social media resources that many of us access. That said, if you look at some of the evidence for what changes practice, it still is expert opinions that you trust. And I think for all of us, that's one of our strategies for overcoming all the stuff that comes at us is we go and say, well, if I want to know something about education, I'll ask Simon. If I want to know something about resuscitation, I'll ask Scott. If I want to know something about trauma, I have the people in my department who I trust have actually gone through that literature in detail. I don't think that's the wrong thing. And I think when you come to SMAC, you are relying on some curation of excellent evidence and some people, I hope, will go away with some very tangible things, but I also hope that they're going away with the idea of like, this is the stuff that's important and this is the stuff I've got to keep looking at the literature about and this is the stuff, more importantly perhaps, that I'm inspired to go back and have a go at changing in my shop. Excellent. Now, we're coming towards the end. So what I'm going to do is a couple of things actually. The first thing is I'm just going to ask the panel to give us something which they would like people to take away today from thinking about the future of medical education, lighting the flame, what do you want them to go away with a little bit of a spark about? More uh, reflective practice every day, what was working well and why, what would you change for next time and why? Uh, building on what Walter's saying, developing the personal courage to tolerate, re, uh, dare I say, receiving feedback or gathering the feedback all around you. Um, that personal software can really turbocharge learning in any area. Uh, be a role model. The, the best way to predict, to predict the future is just to create it yourself. And I think um, role modeling is such a, a strong thing, particularly in medicine. So think about what you want it to be and then be that. Uh, I agree with all that's been said before, but just so I say something different. Uh, I think the idea about seeing that health professional education needs leadership and knowing that all of us probably have to be part of a process of change management so that we can be doing the excellent reflective conversations so that we can be making the most of our role modeling and leveraging it. You need to spend some time creating some knowledge networks, some learning networks and some trust networks that will carry you forward uh, through the next you know, few years of your training. 
Yeah, so you all put everything in the most excellent way, so I'm also going to try and pick something different. And what is it going to be? Um, well, I wanted to say reflective practice, and on that, uh, add to that, that um, there are many ways to learn. And we've given an example of all of those many ways to get to somewhere. So medical education is about adaptive expertise. Jesse? I think, again, I'd be remiss not to come back to the thing of consider interprofessional learning and actually what, it, what that really means. OK, now those are great points. But actually, your views don't count as much as the learners, because that's kind of what it's about. So I think we should invite Natalie back and just see where we're at. Good morning, Natalie. Morning. Uh, welcome back. Thanks, it's been fun. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, we've certainly enjoyed the debate, but I suppose the real question is whether discussing these issues really makes any difference to learners or to patients. And so I thought we should revisit the questions we asked at the beginning of the session. So let's have a think about what you've learned today. Yeah, it sounds reasonable. Do we really understand what we mean by better as a clinician now? I think that first and foremost, I need to go away and do some self-reflection and maybe recognize myself as an, a learner every day and get a bit more self-aware so that I have a framework to decide how I am at the moment before I can be better. And then I, I like the idea of finding out from some other people how I fit into their framework too, just as long as somebody teaches me how to handle that feedback first. Okay, and what about being an educator? Do you still want to be an educator? Yeah, I think it's really important to be a leader in the evolving landscape of medicine, and I think being an educator has a role in that, and I'm, I'm really inspired to be a role model now. And we did... I, I noticed that you've got some exams coming up, haven't you? Yeah. Um, do you feel a little bit more confident that those exams are really a measure of your assessment? I think I realise now that there's no one-size-fits-all approach to assessment and they're maybe going to inform a little bit about what I can do. But I was really excited to hear about some of the ideas about what that might look like in the future, particularly Jenny's comments about, um, about having uh, competency-based assessment. And I really like the idea of integrating regular peer review into my work, so whether that's workplace-based assessment or something less formal. OK. And simulation. You did say you love simulation um, at the beginning. What do you think? about that? Do you still think it's the future of training and assessment? I think I've really been thinking about it wrong and upside down as something I just go and do something and then somebody tells me if it was right or wrong and maybe I need to be working out how I want it to finish first, starting with the objectives and the goals in mind. Okay. I think it's going to give us a really big opportunity to reflect and improve. So it's been a good session. Thank you for staying and thank you for being so bright and early this morning. I think we should leave the final words to you. To me? Mm. Oh, OK. Well, I think I've got a lot to think about now, and I'm really looking forward to continuing this conversation, maybe within this community on social media, like Daniel said, in my personal and learning networks in the coming days. Thank you so much for your time, and have a Thank wonderful you. smack.